Uh, so it's with great pleasure to welcome Dr. David Wilson. He's coming here from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he's a professor of geography with close affiliations with urban and regional planning and African-American studies. His research pivots around the political economy of the city with his specific interests in the politics of urban growth regimes, competing discourses that generate widening socio-spatial inequality, and race, the racializing of the contemporary urban issues of crime and city growth. He served on the editorial board of numerous journals such as Urban Geography, The Professional Geographer, Social and Cultural Geography. He's a prolific author uh, with now countless journal articles, book chapters, and edited volumes published over the years, as well as several books, most recently Chicago's Redevelopment Machine and Blues Clubs, where he does an ethnography of blues bars in Chicago. It helps that David's also a guitarist for a blues band, um, The Painkillers, in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, we're lucky to have him here uh, with the provocative title of his talk today being Making the Smart U.S. City Toward a Dracula Urbanism. I give you David Wilson. David, take it away. Matt, can I, I can be heard. So um, issue number one is, should I wear a mask? Um, no, I'm gonna go without it. And it's so incredibly liberating. I've been teaching with a mask on for, for so long. And this is, this is wonderful. If I get a little paranoid, I'll slip it back on. The other thing is, you know, there's free food there. And when I was in graduate school, if there was free food, I would go right to it. And when I was an undergraduate student, the same thing. So please Yes, help. there's food back there. Please Enjoy help coffee, water. And coffee. That thing would be half done now if I was an undergraduate student and I was here. OK. So um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Matt, thank you. And thank you to each and every one of you for, for being here. Um, I also want to thank very briefly my co-author on this work. When I give this talk, I'm going to use the word I, but it actually should be we. So thank you to um, co-author Elvin Wiley from the University of British Columbia. And uh, he's here in spirit. Uh, two small notes before I begin. Um, note number one is I, I will actually work from a text. And the reason why I made the decision to work from a text is because it keeps me along a pathway. If I just gave ideas without a text, I would get sidetracked. Side and I don't want to do that. I have a lot to say. So the text will discipline me. It will help me. It's not just revanchism that disciplines. We also get disciplined by our texts. So that'll do that. And my second warning, or is it a warning or is it a note? It's a note. And it's a note that, um, so this is only my second official public presentation outside the classroom um, in the last three or three and a half years. So I've been strictly quarantined. So I'm still learning and relearning social skills that you might see. And at the same time, um, uh, the um, how to talk in public has become an issue with me a little bit. So I'm, I'm learning that, relearning that, and bear with me. So if I stare down at my paper, right, it's from a very recent history of just staring at computer screens and teaching by Zoom. So I'll try to deviate from that. OK. Uh, Dracula, you ready for Dracula? Yeah. All right, so I begin with two short quotes. Quote number one is by me. <laughs> Professors are so vain, right? <laughs> so why not quote oneself? Dracula-itis furtively moves among us, not as dreams or legends, but as realities of planetary sprawling growth organizations that seductively extract the essence of others as they propel growth and negotiate the shadows of the ordinary in our cities. That's, that was read fairly quickly. The second quote is from Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula in 1897. Notice how in the same breath it's David Wilson and Bram Stoker. Don't be misled. Um, Bram Stoker said this, the blood is the life. So this paper is an intellectual journey. And 
in a way, an intellectual experiment. And I'm not interested in offering a set of dogmatic statements. Um, you often go to presentations and you hear people going on about definitive ideas and concepts and processes. I'm not going to do that for this talk. So it's a bit of an experiment. My goal is to offer a, a, a reinterpretation. And it's um, to reinterpret a current rage that's occurring in many of our cities. And that is something called smart city building. Smart city building is all over the place. In our cities in the United States, and in fact, way beyond the United States as well. So as many of us realize, because you've taken classes with Matt, <laughs> And Matt's a wonderful instructor. Um, city building has been going on for a long time in the United States. And city building has given us the likes of um, the urban renewal city. And you know the controversies of the urban renewal city. Massive demolition, for example. Massive displacement. More recently, city building has involved something that, calls, that we have called the creative city. Richard Florida and the like. It's also given us the sustainable city. I'm not quite sure what that is. It's one of the most ambiguous terms I've ever heard. But planners have served up this idea of the sustainable city. And now, lo and behold, we have smart city building. So that's what I dig into today. Smart city building sears many US cities. And I think immediately of Chicago, two hours to the north of Champaign-Urbana, New York City, Los Angeles, and yes, Cleveland. You know, if it happens in Cleveland, that means it's a national phenomenon. Um, and um, in many cities as well, including apparently Spokane. That's what I've been told. So it's worth investigating. Um, so what is smart city building? I like the definition, I like the idea that smart city building is the application <clears throat> of science and technology that is applied to make cities more efficient and to make them more effective. So when we think of smart city building, what I think of immediately is the likes of the use of algorithms, the deployment of algorithms, the use of smartphones, the usage of facial recognition technologies, all of these things, <coughs> all of these things that get packaged um, in a way to propel distinctive kinds of city growth, city development, and city redevelopment. So here's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to interpret smart city building in one of the most fascinating places in the United States, Flint, Michigan. And I'm going to use the metaphor of Dracula to understand it. So here I go. Um, I study one place, Flint, experiencing smart city building. And my core thesis is this. What we term the real estate state, and that is the idea of the state becoming entangled with real estate interests to an unprecedented degree. That, in fact, um, the real estate state works through and makes a kind of urbanization that we can fruitfully call Dracula urbanism. My paper is not an attempt to spoof real estate actions. I don't want to do that. But I suggest a new vital metaphor to capture this formation's complicated operation. That is how the real estate state is working. I identify Dracula urbanism as a deep reaching human punishing unfolding that co-works in revanchist persistent times with flagrant forms of human immiseration. In its complexities, it is simultaneously a state of mind, a mode of institutional operation. It's a vision of people. It's a gaze onto growth's true needs and a kind of growth produced. So I suggest in this talk that Dracula-like beliefs and conduct are not dead to time and not dead to fiction, but powerfully lurk today to build places across the United States. 
Yet, Dracula urbanism, to me, is not something new. It's not a new emergence. And it's not a clear break from past trends. But it's rather a missed set of truths in current studies of real estate actions and smart city building outcomes. So my notion of Dracula urbanism has a clear lineage in urban studies. Um, I'm framing this idea. This is very much an experiment, but also it has a lineage associated with it. Urban scholars have developed deft analyses of monstrosities and lurking monsters to understand urban phenomena. Narratives of Frankenstein urbanism, for example, zombie neoliberalism, urban phantomasgorics, <laughs> urban ghosts in the undead city, and others have shed light on previously undetected urban relations and urban forces and urban processes. Most tellingly, and maybe most interestingly, Federico Cugarello's Frankenstein urbanism excavates the rise of visionary urban experiments to rebuild cities, and it's designed to unleash neoliberalized, destructive, fitful behemoths. These experimental horrors lurch forward as loosely connected, patched together fragments that soon escape their maker's control and understanding. Think of Frankenstein moving forward, the patchwork that goes into the making of Frankenstein. So this work, iconoclastic and prophetic, shows that fictions and realities today can meld as indistinguishable wholes. My Dracula urbanist notion locates in this now rich analytic tradition. Now I have this somewhere. Finally. There's Dracula, to put you in the mood. And here's the new downtown Flint. The new downtown Flint. Currently, Flint dives frenetically into smart city building. This urbanizing becomes a metaphor for urban modernity. It promises to deliver scientifically engineered cities by harnessing and integrating calculative digitization, economically propulsive new infrastructures, and sustainable redevelopment, whatever sustainable means. Smart city building, also commonly termed smart growth in Flint and beyond, was once initially a tool to implement only density and land protection mandates. Its scale and focus were relatively limited. Today, it has become something more, a central intervention to foster economic growth and capital accumulation. A term kept alive because of its captivating imagery serves up one more form of the entrepreneurial city. So think of the entrepreneurial city and this Dracula urbanism as having some sort of complicated entanglement. OK, so Dracula urbanism and the real estate state. My Dracula urbanist notion draws on the original rendition of the monster, Bram Stoker's fictitious vampire and Transylvania nobleman who spent meaningful time in a crumbling castle in the Carpathian Mountains. A true planetist, Dracula does not belong to any particular place. He's a creature of the world and roots nowhere. Who does that sound like? Capital. He momentarily resides in castles as a global vagabond that nests in only expedient places. Beneath a veneer of aristocratic charm, the Count possesses a concealed and dark soul. Who does that sound like? Capital. Polite, cunning, and conniving, Dracula assumes many forms. Respectable scientist, an animal, a technocratic curator of science and history. For nourishment, Dracula lives off the blood of hypnotized, unwitting culprits. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Subjects are seduced through a mix of erotic charm and exoticized decline. For example, the mystique of Gothic decaying castles and landscapes. And equally important, and at the core of his actions, and maybe most important, Dracula believes that it is only through the imposition of death upon the undeserving 
that is killing the culturally inferior and flawed, that rebirth and new life can begin. For this undeserving, there is to be no rehabilitation or therapeutizing. Stokeler's Dracula, Dracula, reflecting the era's British imperialist sensibilities, serves up a relentlessly punishing character intent on purifying a deeply ruptured world. So from my first guidepost, smart city building by real estate states seeks to destroy the ways and character of the supposedly degenerate. That is, immigrants, new arrivals, culturally fallen poor people, socially, morally anti-civic residents. This endeavor tackles age-old city villains, decline and blight. And many of us realize decline and blight are euphemisms. And they've been used in urban planning to get at populations and land uses that were deemed degenerate. This hardest of neoliberal edges is the kill back the city to greatness logic. Again, kill back the city to greatness logic, whose full ambitions can never be fully presented in full clarity. In Dracula-like fashion, sense of brave and deaf social class must eradicate what these actors so deeply demonize as counter-civic, the ways and influences of the dirty, the disheveled, the decrepit. So Dracula urbanism is not revanchism. I'm suggesting, rather, it is a companion to this. That is, it is less obvious attempts to eradicate the city's supposed deepest ills. While revanchism mixes anger and vengeance with classic moral panics, for example, defining clear threats, stereotyping main characters as species of monsters, unveiling brute and simple solutions, Dracula urbanism does something else. It sneakily seeks to eradicate the degenerate and put the degenerate quotes around it. City building, of course, has a long history of killing off people's ways and spaces. Histories of city building to Rossi have destroyed as much as they have built. But my reinterpretation and our reinterpretation of the current scene suggests something distinctive. Eerily reminiscent of Stoker's 19th century world, smart growth operatives target the dispositions and cultures of select communities. It plans their demise and obscures the malevolent aspects of their programs. If revanchist politics, that many of you know about, is elaborate spectacle, and I think it is elaborate spectacle, Dracula-esque politics is furtive and underbelly-like. Okay, my second guiding principle, real estate states adopt a self-nourishing strategy that is a bolstering parasitism that provides the lifeblood of their existence. An elaborate subsisting through the resources of other entities, for example, national and global foundations, public-private partnerships, ensures their survival. Just as Dracula draws nourishment from socially seducing and sucking the blood of taken-in victims, these real estate states depend on their own mode of blood extraction. Real estate states needing money, political capital, and social legitimacy obtain these via two things. Number one, social seductions. And number two, extractions of resources. My third guiding principle before I get to Flint. We're good. Uh, this Dracula-esque real estate state is seen to rely on a key resource to build cities, decline. Just as Dracula strategically uses decline to identify the venomous, the venomous things in need of change, for example, the genetically defective, cultural inferior stocks of people, socially backward communities in Transylvania and in the UK, and politically seduced subjects, real estate states today operate similarly. These entities work through eroded neighborhoods, crumbling districts, boarded up housing, culturally zapped poor people, looming ghettos, and decayed infrastructures to push their smart city building, and a smart city building whose destruction of purported city cancers, 
takes the form of new market opportunities, new demonstration projects, and testing grounds for sustainability and resilience. The logic of this, these are urgent days for real estate capital and for real estate states. With vanishing financial and discursive resources in present neoliberal days, many real estate states, that is real estate interests, and government are desperate for replenishment. My fourth guiding principle. We, or I, place these Dracula-esque real estate states at the heart of what gives these formations their very existences, planetary urbanization. And that's a key concept here. Planetary urbanization is a notion of the world and how its places are made. And it originated with the musings of French philosopher Henri Lefebvre decades ago. My planetary urbanist specifics. Like Dracula's actions as a truly planetary operative, for example, fact-finding across the globe to gain understanding about its potential victims, using international catalogs to construct the ideal place and person to change, using British high modernist aesthetics in his non-modernist castle to disorient his victims, real estate states do something similar. They execute smart city building as fragmented, centerless creations. So smart city building facilitated by real estate states involves multi-scalar interconnected networks of logistics that splatter across the earth. Now, an important point here. Urban studies across the global north and the global so south have long linked city building and their driving institutions to multi-scalar networks of organizations and processes. That's been long acknowledged. But my planetary urbanist vision replaces the dominant vision of tentacle connected cities with a different notion. The idea of non-centric, multiple starting point urbanizations and urbanizations that stretch, transcend, and reconfigure traditional Euclidean spatialities of centers and peripheries. In other words, doing away with the classic core binary distinction. Planetary urbanization takes that distinction and obliterates it. It's an eccentric vision of how cities and other things grow. All right, let's get to Flint. There's Flint, a city of about 95,000 people, 93,000 people. And uh, some of you might have been to Flint before. If you get a chance, it's truly worth it. Um, many of us know Flint via the water crisis. It's still going on. It's taken various forms, new modulations. Um, it's still there. Flint is a city that um, has very aggressively jumped onto this new kind of growth strategy. The city of Flint, on the brink of bankruptcy the last 10 years, urgently seeks to grow and regrow its economic base and tax rateables. It now emerges from fiascos like the Mott Foundation-funded GM Auto World theme park in 1984 which was finally torn down in 1997, which was the centerpiece of the city's great leap forward. Yes, Flint had a great leap forward. Smart city building has followed with one core foci, an eight to nine block health and wellness district, and in rhetoric, building a stable growth catalyzing core would trigger something smart and big in Flint. That's a quote from a planner a local plan. The first anchor, the Flint Farmer's Market, owned by Flint's major developer, Uptown Reinvestment Corporation, has been sold as, quote, a state-of-the-art, digitally connected place for nutritious food and social gathering that could help reverse Flint's decades of disinvestment and abandonment. The second anchor, the 92-unit marketplace housing, is a 50-50 venture between PK Housing 
and Uptown Reinvestment, which was hailed as, quote, Flint's smart answer to Chicago's Wicker Park and New York's Alphabet City. And both projects had been heavily financed by other organizations, especially the Mott Foundation, a multinational corporation that works across the globe very aggressively. And uh, Mott is very actively involved in Flint, where it has its origins. So this is the Marketplace Project that I've mentioned. And this is the main drag, Saginaw Street. And the Health and Wellness District extends in this general area over here. And the Flint Farmer's Market, I'm going to test my jumping skills, is right over there, <laughs> is just to the west of the old Flint Journal Lofts on First Street. And this is the focus. This is where smart city building has decided to dig in. It's been the place of concentration. All right, Dracula-itis. Dracula-itis and Flint. Flint's smart urbanizing currently unfolds to fundamentally reflect a Dracula-like city building. At this core, major developer uptown investment and other real estate capitals forge a Dracula-like, shadowy, parasitic connection with mega funders, and especially the Mott Foundation. Without the Mott Foundation, I don't think we'd have uptown investment. And uptown investment is the most visible figure who often takes credit, ironically, for new building, new investment, new upscaling in the health and wellness district and in areas beyond that. Uptown investment in Dracula-like fashion subsists on Mott support, which provides more than 60% of its yearly budget. At the same time, it seductively bolsters this relation, much like charismatic Dracula, who socially seduces subjects before feeding off them. As Uptown revealed in discussion to me, they sustain the Mott tie through a sly strategy, advertising itself to them as on the ground growth experts willing to be their quote, down and dirty empirical tentacle. Uptown Executive Clark noted that to us. Yeah, we nudge them. We let them know we have the expertise and will to do the political and social stuff to redevelop Flint that will serve their interests. It makes our partnership pretty tight. The parasitic connection that's so crucial to Uptown investment and the real estate state. This Dracula-esque smart growth roots in a sense of what this growth purportedly requires strategic destruction. So this is not put on the table standard creative destruction. And many of, us, many of us know about the concept of standard creative destruction. But it is rather unstated belief to the public that progress requires deep human and physical emisceration. On the one hand, a notion of incubating life circulates widely in Flint the need to make livability in a struggling city. And that's a quotation. And quote, give life to failing areas. But a deeper guiding belief structures these actions. That is, sources of city degradation, understood as human ways, for example, of the underclass, spaces, quote, black ghettos, and processes, quote, poor black culture, need annihilation. In deep belief, planners and investors, like Dracula's restless hunt for victims, targets a city's vast labyrinth of supposedly decrepit people, culture, and social ways to ward off a growing degeneracy. In thought, Flint's problematic of perpetual circulation of people, cultures, anxieties needs a kind of sociogenetic transmutation the Dracula equivalent of replacing impure blood with pure blood. Thus, in the last three years alone, hundreds of poor racialized Flintonians have lost their homes. They've lost their sociocultural infrastructures, and they've lost their life pathways from seizures of land and property. 
Most notoriously, more than 300 downtown residents in and around the marketplace housing and Sylvester Broom Village projects were dislocated and forced into the city's cracks and crevices with no public acknowledgment. They were forced into alleys, abandoned buildings, written off blocks. State officials failed to talk about what many see when you walk around Flint. People reeling from the destruction of homes, social venues, and life-enriching spaces. A modern-day usage of Dracula's degeneracy crisis leads to an evisceration rather than a therapeutizing. So the disease core of Flint, the supposed disease core, it follows from my comments, lies in its lurking shadows and pathologies. And what happens is ethical legibility goes out the window. And it goes out the window as planners and investors say they need to cleanse Flint of the usual things. Quote, declined spaces. Quote, eroded blocks. Quote, neighborhood blight. Quote, creeping physical decay. Killing and destruction, and not literally a killing of people, but killing of people's ways and their social spaces, their modes of belief. Killing in the process becomes despectacalized as a shroud of secrecy pushes revanchous ruthlessness to have a partner in arms. The right to imagine such brutality with a question mark. Like Dracula, these capitals endow themselves with cold, steely insight into the present and the future of the city. That is, what Flint is becoming and what it needs to become. Wearing this custodial ethos leads them, that is real estate capital, to reject long-standing Western notions of objective and dispassionate clinicians for city growth. All right, decenteredness and decline, and how these are used to build the city in this draconian way. At the same time, Flint's Dracula urbanism is a decentered, messy extension across the planet, much like Dracula's planetized operations already discussed. For example, leading financer Mott embeds in key global circuitries, namely cultural capital circulation and profit extraction. It extracts cultural capital and it extracts profit across the globe that enables it to be involved in this one particular site, Flint, Michigan. And planetary urbanization tells us never lose sight of those connections, the decenteredness of this process as it actually exists. So on the cultural capital front, Mott amasses this resource by funding over 400 city growth projects in 2021 across the earth. Bearing this ideal, more than $1 billion in grants distributed include projects in Shanghai, Singapore, London, and New York. Recognized as one of the world's leading ambassadors of modernity, Mott now receives acclaim as arguably the globe's most innovative entrepreneurial foundation. The Chinese government calls them, quote, the leading light of progressive human-aiding philanthropy in the world. The UK government calls Mott I hope nobody here works for Mott, but um, they're taking a bit of a battering, but that's okay. The UK government titles them the best providers of human infrastructure that any government could hope for. And that's a quote. And in this context, Mott serves on the network of European Foundation for Innovative Cooperation and the European Foundation Center. So Mott is really powerful. And in key ways, it's calling the shots with respect to what's going on in Flint. Mott's success at the same time is tied to another decentralized sprawling tentacle, securing profit and capital from a global production apparatus. And this clearly extends to the extraction of surplus from third world miners and petty laborers. This diffuse and sprawling 
action space extending across the globe that renders surplus and profit extraction territorial irrelevant provides Mott with this essential resource. So this seizure, about $1.2 billion per year, with more than $3 billion in total assets, is cloaked by the enormous scale of the interconnections that eludes easy detection. Mott's continuous search for new global veins of profit through these is manifest in a dizzying portfolio of diverse investments. Thus, Mott in 2021 massively invested in TIAA, Amazon, and Apple, who themselves had their own tentacles of relations to enable their economic solvency. It follows that processes that fold into Flint's smart city building move across the globe, eluding the trained city eye. So think of the trained urbanist and how we're systematically taught to envision the city. And the first thing we do is gaze onto the urban environment. But city growth so often is dependent upon and reliant upon processes that elude our trained eyes. Right? The, um, the reality is what goes on in Zimbabwe, where there is the elaborate extraction of surplus from gold mining and lithium mining, in fact, in fact pads the wallets of the Mott Foundation, that enables them to come into Flint and do things like subsidize upscale zoning and to enact very harsh policing, broken windows policing, which really is the leading edge of smart city building. And decline is actively used to promote Flint's smart urbanizing. Instead of this phenomenon being forgotten and erased in growth, growth actually centers the usage of decline. So we have this tendency to make a distinction, a distinction between growth and decline. And many of us in the urban profession, <laughs> urban planners, uh, urban geographers, we have traditionally been socialized into the belief that growth is the antithesis of decline that growth tends to produce decline as a residual end product, end of story. But I'm suggesting, and we're suggesting, that in fact, these two are highly interconnected. They're deeply entangled. And in effect, to have growth, you need to mobilize decline. You need to mobilize decline as a resource, which is a very different way of viewing what decline is and what growth is. So decline is actively used to promote Flint smart urbanizing. Instead of being forgotten and erased in growth, it is centered. Some examples. Um, new smart city building, recently pushed by the City Planning Commission and the Flint Genesee Growth Alliance, acquires credibility by promising to protect and nurture a fragile downtown upgrade. But the use of the term, the fragile upgrade, I suggest, is code. It's coded for decline, decrepit things. That is, the black youth threat and the supposed dilemma of roaming black youth downtown. Right? Decline is being imaginatively harnessed and being mobilized to promote city growth. Not surprisingly, the centerpiece of the new policing, heightened surveillance, locates its 17 new digital cameras, which are connected to a seven-day police monitoring station in the downtown. Decline here becomes a matter of, of class and place. These people in neighborhoods are to be both taken for granted and objects of unending concern. So what constitutes, what's represented as decline, in this case, people with particular skin color and people with a certain class affiliation. They were to be taken for granted that they are declined subjects, declined things. 
but they are also to be objects of unending concern to residents in Flint. And hence, there's a lot of support for the systematic marginalization and purge of decline that is at the foundation of current city growth today in Flint. And this reality is to be beyond doubt and further interpretation. OK, let me conclude, because I think that time has come. Um, I've chronicled now an ascendant real estate state. And again, you know, the entanglement of real estate interests, like uptown investment, and government officials, and uptown, um, and Mutt Foundation as well. I've chronicled how they today build smart cities, which they often term smart growth, in a way that urbanists have been slow to recognize as a Dracula urbanist process. Smart city building as a planetary process, like Dracula, seeks to purify a socially contaminated world. Interventions seek to eradicate the ways of the supposedly culturally degenerate, use decline and decrepitness as a key project sustaining resource, and nourish itself through a parasitic attaching to key hosts. Now, my analysis, of course, reveals insights that are always relative. I acknowledge that. And that are always inseparable from a, a, from a chosen, informing frame of meaning, and one that guides my vision, my gaze, my findings. So this project, this work, is ultimately an interpretive one. Remember way back when I said this was going to be an experimental interpretive project. And what it does is it centers Flint's real estate state as fundamentally dark, goal-mystifying interventionists in neoliberalism's complicated ideological and tactical unfolding. My vision thus moves beyond notions of punishing revanchist and easily read formations. And what I see is a dense weave of powerful actors and institutions that follow their deepest felt truths. Dracula-itis, I submit, yeah, I made up that word. I don't know if it's a real word. Dracula-itis should no longer occupy the edges of academic imaginaries. Let me suggest that. And this idea, I believe, does structure current growth and urbanization dynamics, but for reasons that are not yet entirely clear. So I'll stop there because of the time restriction given. OK, thank you. Questions for David? <laughs> yes? I guess I'm just interested in, um, you know, we were talking about how to use the decline and using that as a statement, basically, that's been propagandized and utilized. Um, in one way, but it can be utilized in, in another. And I was just hoping you, now that you're still in your talk, maybe you could you, um, talk a little bit more about how that can be used in a positive way to be helpful to the situation, rather than as it's being used by Mar and company to direct the life of Right, Dracula. okay. So shall I answer one question, take questions? I'll, I can answer a question one at a time. Let's do one at a time. Okay, okay. yeah. Um, using decline as a, as a positive in the city. It really depends, I'm going to complicate it a little bit, because it really depends on whose vision you sanction. So what goes on in Flint today, the mobilization of decline, is actually seen extremely positively. Um, the planning community says this is really, the, the degree to which they can actually conceptualize that decline is being used, if we confronted them about it, they would say, yeah, it's positive because it's creating more investment in the city. It's bringing builders and developers into our community. And they're reviving, that's the term that would be used, reviving downtown. And it's also stabilizing the tax base. Although stabilizing Flint's tax base is a difficult proposition. They have a long way to go. 
it's a very um, disinvested city. But it, moving in that direction, I think you'd find a lot of people who would say that um, the usage of decline to promote growth is positive. Uh, there are some people who agree with that to some degree, but would dissent and say that the problem is that there are costs incurred when you mobilize decline, especially when you're dealing with with people, human bodies, and they become displaceable, and they become chased out of urban environments where they might have raised their family and their kids and all that sort of stuff. So to complicate the question, it depends on who you ask for, and who you ask and, and their take onto the reality of it. Well, I guess I would want to know, if I'm helping a community that's more local and not not, um, if I was a planner there, mm -hmm. trying to help uh, the community, and I'm trying to help uh, the black youth here I am, the white lady coming in, we'll say I'm hiring twins. Okay. Uh, how do I mobilize that decline in a manner that benefits the community in the way they see fit? Yeah, I, I guess the best strategy, if I was a planner in Flint, was to try to gain a consensus about that, that people on the ground have about what decline is and acquire from them a sense of the negativities that are associated with that decline. And if there's a belief that this thing is an impediment to community building, to neighborhood restructuring in a positive way, then I think you can target that and say, all right, let's use planning resources and make use of the Mott Foundation and Uptown Investment to change that. And I think Uptown and Mott, that's the rhetoric they give. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what they say they're doing. So I mean, this is not an easy issue. And I'm being a bit flippant about, about Dracula urbanism, but I want to present a very different way of seeing this. Um, the flippancy is, is advertent. <laughs> yeah, Curtis. Um, uh, so, wonderful talk. I loved every second of it. Oh, thanks. Um, so my question was actually just kind of about the history. You mentioned that this, this Dracula urbanism has existed throughout history. And since we don't have a, since we don't have a, uh, you know, a bunch of free real estate to invest in in um, in the U.S., how when there was more free real estate, um, you know, expansion uh, expansion westward, um, how would that have looked? Do you know off the top of your head of a of a case study like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. I have not done a historical analysis sure. of, of other cities and looked back across a, an expansive time frame to understand Dracula urbanism. At this point, I'm, I'm trying to flesh out the, the logic of the argument. It's a great question. Uh, I could offer speculations. Um, I think it's been with us for, for a while. I think there are forces and processes now that might be embellishing it, that are exacerbating it. Um, but I think our cities have been very class divided for a long time and very demarcated and hierarchicalized by race and the production of racialization. And when that is the reality of it, then you see the tendency of people, especially people in positions of power in cities, to want to transform them. That is, um, if you want to recapture the city as a place, right? If you want to recapture it, rebuild it, then it's the people at the bottom of the hierarchy, the class structure, the racialized structure, that become expendable. So I have a very strong hunch that, that this is not totally new. And one of the, just to riff off that for a second, uh, one of the things that got me interested in this, besides the fact that I read Dracula, and I thought, wow, there, I, I read it when I was, when I was on leave. And I thought there were eerie parallels here between what Dracula is saying and what's going on in our cities. And, and that stimulated me to do it. Um, I was going to say something else. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, OK. I think, I think you've been waiting, and then I'll go to you first. But just it struck me, just to add on to that, if you go back and read Marx's first volume of Capital, Marx literally refers to the bourgeoisie as 
vampire-like in the way they suck That's surplus great. value from the proletariat. That's before Bram Stoker wrote the book. Um, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I think, I think the microphone will be overkill for me. I'm a loud voice. Okay, go for it. Uh, so, is there a way that Flint can, because like, do you feel, like, you have like the vibe of like, get rich quick schemes or like, lose weight fast things, like these gimmicks Flint has been doing? Yeah. Is there a way Flint can sustainably grow wealth, like without using things like the smart city or that General Motors world? Was yeah. It? yeah, yeah, the GM, GM world, yeah. Are there ways to do that? Yeah, but I think one has to understand where Flint has been and what they want to become. So, I mean, Flint has emerged, just to bolster that point a little bit, Flint has emerged from this water crisis. And I talked to people in Flint about it, and I've never seen more disillusioned, angry, upset people. You know, it was a classic case of, you know, it was Republican politics that assigned an emergency manager to the city in 2014. And um, that emergency manager wanted to save $83,000. So he decided to shift the water supply from the um, Detroit River to the Flint River. And it ended up poisoning a generation of people. So they were, the result of that is at the moment, and has been, terrible disillusionment with the state apparatus, right? There, there's a lot of distrust of government. So government's clipping along, and it feels like it needs to do something novel, needs to do something new. And what's coming down the pike? Smart city building. It's in Shanghai, it's in Jakarta, it's in New York City, it's in Los Angeles. Hey, why don't we give it a shot? And that way, maybe we'll appear innovative, and um, in the process of being innovative, maybe we can induce some positive changes in the city. So in a way, the city of Flint has jumped on to an expedient opportunity structure. There was a potential opportunity for them to legitimate themselves, where they had lost a lot of their legitimacy. And that's how I see them as getting involved in smart city growth. Now, are there other avenues? That's really your question. I think there are. But you know, Flint's, a, Flint's a, tough taste, a tough place to revitalize. It's been systematically abandoned. Human life doesn't seem to count that much. It's a predominantly working class and poor African American city. Uh, population loss has been traumatic to the city. And um, there's no easy solution, short of circumventing capitalism, but you know, how do you do that? Um, and therefore, smart city growth was, was kind of the logical thing for them to try. Yes, there were other opportunities, other possibilities. But I don't think they've been sufficiently imagined at this point. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah here you go. Hi. Um, Hi. I have kind of a specific question, mm -hmm. and maybe more outside of Flint, because I'm not super familiar with Flint myself. Um, but in doing research on food resources, such as community gardens, farmers markets, and the such that are there to benefit minority communities, mm -hmm. they don't always benefit in the way that they're supposed to. Right. And many times was, I think British Columbia was an example where they were having leases for their community gardens and minority areas. Mm -hmm. And then once their lease was up, they were taking that property and building higher end lofts or condos and such instead right. of actually keeping the land for its purpose. Right. I guess um, my question is, how often do you see these performative food resources as a way to mark decline, or what's seen as decline? And how often are, do they kind of leave the mark of a place to rebuild or gentrify? Yeah. I yeah, don't that's know a great that's question. Too specific. No, 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 that's fine. That's great. Um, the answer is yes. In Flint, you have alternative gardening going on. Um, it's a problematic thing for a number of reasons. One of the reasons why it's problematic, actually, is because people never truly know when they choose, a, say, a vacant lot or an abandoned block or space um, how healthy the soil is. There's been so much 
toxic stuff that's been strewn across the city. And nobody knows, nobody can map it, right? Because it's done <coughs> illicitly. So nobody wants to eat tarred food like that. And it, it becomes an issue. Um, my sense is that it is not seen as decline. That is the act of revegetating a space and doing it in a, in a fruitful and productive way. But that space in a, is also often imagined as a kind of leading edge of a space that's declined. So alternative food gardening is not associated with suburbanization, with healthy, vibrant white spaces, for example. It's often associated with working class and poor racialized spaces. So to do that kind of gardening, I think, is a signifier. On the one hand, it's seen as fruitful and productive. On another hand, on the other hand, it's seen as an indice for spaces that need help and assistance. It's like so many things. It, there's a lot of ambiguity with respect to how one interprets this. Any other questions? We have a few minutes left. For, yeah. Here you go. So my question is primarily around gentrification. So the idea behind improving the spaces um, and, and moving towards gentrification then is going to attract a, high, a higher people class, for lack of a better phrase. Mm -hmm. And so is there a logical way that, that you have found to protect those that are currently occupying those spaces from being pushed out by the improvements that are meant to go ahead and yeah. in the moment improve, improve quality of life? Yeah. That's the classic question, right? How do you protect people in the face of gentrification? I think I have an idea, but nobody listens to me. Um, my idea is, is, is maybe this. If, um, if you have an area that's deemed hot for reinvestment, and builders and developers think that they can make a lot of money by building condos and, and refurbishing brownstones and so forth. Why not impose a tax on them? We'll call it a gentrification tax. And stipulate that for every, it's like a capital gains tax, for every $100,000 of profit that they make, they have to pay 7% of that to a public fund. And developer A does that, developer B does that, developer C does that, and soon you have a pool of money that could conceivably be redistributed to financially threatened, economically vulnerable households and families. Will it work? I don't know. Because the forces of, of gentrification are so strong. And clearly, it wouldn't work in some places, because some builders and developers would balk at the additional tax. But there are many places right, that I believe um, builders and developers would have little qualms about paying the additional tax because of a perception of how much money they could make in the process of gentrification. So tax these people and give the money to, to the financially threatened. Um, my guess would be that real estate capital would soon go to court and litigate it and say, this is unfair. And who knows what would happen. Yeah. Wait, are you looking at me here? Oh, oh I don't know who was first. No, no, no. Okay. Also, for those on Zoom, if you have a question, um, if you put it in the q and I'll attend to it. Mostly, I just have a comment about what you were just referencing because um, a couple months ago, I was looking into that, and there's actually communities in California that are taxing developers, right. and then they do have protections for people in sensitive areas. Um, and I, I believe those tax funds are going, like, I think there's places where that's actually happening, which is right. pretty good to see. Yeah. yeah, that's great. I guess it wasn't my idea, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time this happened. OK. Oh, I think Jim, next. Thank, thanks, Matt. Uh, Dr. Wilson, thank you for your talk. It was fantastic. Oh, great. Thanks. And I, I have just a, a question about eminent domain. I'm wondering, is the city or the, is the government using eminent domain to seize private property for redevelopment in Flint? Mm -hmm. The answer 
The short answer is yes, but it's been very controversial. So eminent domain has been used historically in Flint, and it's engendered a lot of controversy, which is not surprising, because it's, it's government seizure of, of land for the public interest. And how they've defined the public interest has been very, has been interpreted by some as being very shady. Um, so they, they've cut it back, but eminent domain is still, the, is still the tool of last resort. And yes, it is still being used. I, I'm sorry to hear that, but th thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, and we're, we're out of time, um, but I think we still have the space. Uh, if there's any other questions, if you have to leave, well understood, of course. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to David Wilson. Appreciate it.